2 Timothy 3.16. says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine. Doctrine is a teaching. It's your teaching. It's, 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 uh, has anybody ever taught you how to drive? They taught you a certain way. And some people can teach driving and some people shouldn't and some people can. <laughs> but he's talking about scripture. And the problem is, is sometimes we put our own slant on it. You have to be careful with that. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God, so it must be taught in the way that God intended. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. We're going to be corrected. We're going to be uh, approached scripturally that there'll, there'll be some changing needed in your life for correction, for, for instruction in righteousness. Another verse of scripture, Hebrew 4.12. And I'm going to read these, this verse and then I'm going to pray and you'll be seated and we'll get into this tonight. For the word of God is quick and it's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. There's a metaphor being used here. And a lot of times when I was first introduced to the Bible, um, in other words, the blade cuts going that way and the cuts coming this way cuts but it's also a weapon when you're being attacked it's a weapon to protect yourself are you hearing what i'm saying piercing even to dividing sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and and, and listen to this is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart and that's crucial because a lot of time we live in a world today where people are making profit of other people using scripture. I'm not afraid of people owning Bibles and reading them. But if you look back in our history, there was a period of time where they wanted to keep general public from reading the Bible. I took RE in England. Did they still teach that when you were in school? Right, I'd go to the class called RE, and then right after that, I'd go to history and learn about evolution. RE was religious education. Miss Stacy was my teacher. And she got to go to Israel one time and she came back with a, a jar of the Dead Sea. Never forgot, never forgot it. So I would have religious education and the evolution so that I could make my own decisions about what I was gonna believe. And I, I, I'm, I'm for that. I don't mind people teaching evolution. I have a problem with it all. If you wanna believe you came from a monkey, you go ahead and run with that. I believe I was fearfully and wonderfully made like the Bible says. So anyway, Jesus, we thank you for your word tonight. God, I pray that you help me with this, this, this quick uh, instruction tonight. Open our hearts and our minds to receive your word in the fertile soul of our souls. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I'm going to read Revelations 22 and 19. I'm going to be scripture heavy for a few moments just to try to Get the word of God out there. But I want to talk to you about the dangers of distorted doctrine. And remember, doctrine is a teaching. Uh, Revelations 22 and 19 warns us, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So we're not to alter the Word of God. We're not to alter the Bible. There, we, we've got to care. In fact, Paul wrote a letter to Galatians. Paul, the same writer who was previously Saul, we're going to talk about him a bit tonight, wrote uh, uh, to, the, to the Galatians in, in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He said, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So there, there's, there, there, we need to take note of doctrine or teaching. Just because there's something called a church on every corner doesn't necessarily mean that's the church Jesus is coming to take out of the world. Are you hearing what I'm saying? As we said before, so say I now again. He's going to repeat himself. In other words, he's putting emphasis 
on don't change the Bible. Don't alter what it means. And here's this phrase we hear all the time. Well, that's your truth. Or this is my truth. Let me tell you something. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. So I don't have a truth. I'm going to believe this truth. And I'm responsible for making sure I'm understanding it, how it's intended and written. I'm going to get into that in a minute. Any other gospel unto you than we have received, let him be accursed. Another, another verse of scripture for you, to, if you would like to highlight it or go there, is 1 Corinthians 14, 33. And I think this is key because it's easy, easy to get confused if you're not a studier. How many here knows how to drive a manual transmission vehicle? Let's make this more fun. If you don't, stand up. Yeah, come on, got to be If you don't know how to drive, ain't nothing wrong with that. Okay. You can be seated. Hey, if you don't know how, you know how to drive a car, but you just can't drive that car. In fact, out of just being funny, they say if you don't want your car to be stolen, just go ahead and buy a, a manual transmission car because all the young people that are stealing today wouldn't know how to drive it anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to offend anybody. I thought it was kind of funny when I read that. All right. You're probably wondering why I got, uh, hey, anybody know what this is sitting in front of the pulpit? What is it? Hey, put your stuff down and come sit down on this chair, please. What are you doing? What? Why? Speak loud. Oh, it'd be uncomfortable. What else would you say about this chair? You do agree that it's a chair, but you don't want to sit on, that chair's for sitting on, right? But you don't want to sit on it how it's presented. What do you want to do? Intend it, so let's do that. So we know that the, though that this chair was designed for a specific use to be sat on in a certain way, and I misrepresented the chair. I, I put it in a way that it was not, and he walked up to it knowing that's not correct. Now, if you were a bunch of cavemen walking out of the woods and I said that's for sitting on, you probably would have tried to make it work the way it was because that's how it was presented to you, but you didn't know any better. You can take that chair back to the back and be seated. All right. That's my metaphor. Are we ready to go eat? I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. In order for that chair to be, and the word he used was comfortable. Now the Lord uses the word rest. We have to see it the right way. Luckily for Christian, he's got a few years under his belt, and he understood that chair is not being presented properly for me to sit on. Let me adjust it. It matters how you use the chair. He could have sat on it like it was, but he would not have gotten the rest. It would have been very uncomfortable, and the chair would not be a blessing to him. Because if you get it in the wrong position, it's not going to be used properly if you don't understand how it's supposed to be used. So he turned the chair over so that he could use it. Make sense? God's Word the doctrine, the teachings, the principles, and commands. We have to understand, like that chair, are designed for a certain way of use. You just can't present it any old way. It is to be used for reproof and dot for teaching, right? That's how God designed his word for us. There, it's specifically designed by an articulate and meticulous God. Scripture's not to be striven against. We don't change the word. The word changes. Mm -hmm. The word was never meant for other believers and us to fight over. It's not meant to be cost, constantly caustic to believers. I understand there's a struggle for people to want to come to church and be a believer, not because they're on the outside, but because they see the fighting on the inside. 
Remember, Paul made the comment, everybody has a psalm, everybody has a doctrine. Everybody. There's confusion. But that does not negate the fact that the Bible is still to be obeyed. It is still teaching us. It is still the word to live by. In other words, when they said don't alter it, we need the word of God to live so we can get our name in the book of life. Now, I mentioned Paul, who was a writer of a majority of the New Testament, correct? But before he was Paul, what was his name? Saul. Now, if you know your Bible, he was in cahoots with the high priest, right? If you read, he was going to Damascus to get letters so that he could take people of the name of Jesus and persecute them, right? Saul was a pretty religious guy. He took making sure he shut down what he thought was false doctrine in a very severe way, right? He was passionate. He was sincere. But he was sincerely wrong. So when he actually, if you have your Bibles, turn Acts chapter 9 and verse 5, when he came in contact with that God that he thought he was representing, well, we had a bit of a situation, don't we? Acts 9 and 5 says, and he said, who art thou, Lord? Because he had been writing, and next thing you know, he finds himself in the dirt, on the ground, and a light shone. And he says, who, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. In other words, you're taking religion the wrong direction, and you're making it hard. You're making it difficult. You are causing problems with something that I've instilled and put on this planet to save humanity. Hey, Saul, you're way off, pal. And luckily for Paul, face to face with the fact that he's been wrong, face to face with the fact that he's been passionately wrong, sincerely wrong. But do you realize what he said? There's so much pride in the world today, we can literally hand you a verse of Scripture and show you. I don't see it that way. But yet here's Saul saying, what would you have me to do? And if you were here on Sunday, you know that the Lord gave Saul two friends, Ananias and Barnabas. Because basically God was saying, you got the chair all wrong, Saul. You got the right makings for a chair, but the way you got it, it hurts people. The way you presented it, we can't, I can't use it. I need someone to help you align the chair. Are you with me? So he, he, he invites the situation to where he can now be connected with the disciples of Jesus Christ so that he could experience salvation. And if you read it, he gets baptized and he gets the Holy Ghost and he gets straightened out. Next thing you know, he straightway starts preaching and teaching. Why? Because he didn't take six months or a year to finally decide, okay, I'll do it God's way. <laughs> the foundational understanding of the way and purpose of God and all that... That was done. And I'm not, I'm not baiting and switching on you. Really comes down to one word. Love. Love will instruct and show a person their error. Mm -hmm. Now, don't confuse love and the word tolerance. If you're doing something wrong, oh, God help you that someone love you enough to say, hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute here. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In 2 Timothy, Paul writing still, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. I remember as a brand new convert, I was one of those. I looked for someone 
that I knew would not have it right. And I wanted to joust. I wanted to spar. I did in my youth. And I'm so thankful that I grew up. And I realized that the word of God, it's quick and powerful all on its own. It needs me to love people to give them the truth. And so he teaches here, but to be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Listen, if you don't have the doctrine right, if you don't know have it how it's intended, you're opposing yourself. You're hurting yourself and you're hurting those around you. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, do you realize how wonderful, how powerful, how needful repentance is? If Paul didn't have that element of, of repentance when he got struck down, he could have been just an angry blind man. Not willing to listen to an Ananias. Not willing to realize, I need a Barnabas to, to, to help me join with the brethren that don't trust me. Oh, thank God. And everybody that desires the office of a minister, there needs to be something about you. You don't want to cause, you want to pull people together and you don't want to tolerate people that want to divide. Are you hear what I'm saying? And that they may recover themselves, listen to this, out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by a man as will. Understand, this all this division and this different church here and different church there, that was never the will of God. Never was. It's our calling as a church, as a body of Christ, to help people use the word properly so that we can step into somebody's life, wait a minute, you got the chair wrong. Let me turn that over and show you. You got that scripture out of context. Let me help you. Are you hearing me? Everything God gives us, there is a purpose. There's proper position. There's proper orientation and, and context because all Scripture, all Scripture. Now, I'll be honest with you. There are some in the canon or in our Bible that were added. There were. Most of you don't even know what they are or where they are unless you get in deep in study and you realize in the canonization of Scripture, there were some things done and added. Just because you see the little italics word, that's not all. There are some actual, and I'm not going to get into that tonight. But that's for another Bible study or a private Bible study, because there are some people, you're, you're, you're believing some things, or people in the world believe some things that are altered, because you don't realize that wasn't in the original canon, and that was added. And then you start coming up, you got NIV and all these, you go through you know, 500 different Bibles and a new one every year. Something's happened, folks. Uh, the book of Revelation has been unheeded. The book of Galatians was unheeded. Paul, of anybody who was saw, who got corrected, understood, don't change this stuff. But there's been a lot of changing going on. God gave us this Bible. He gave us the church with love because he's loving. Now we receive the word of God and receive teaching with that understanding. Like a chair that's repositioned, you're going to find the comfort, the rest, the purpose, and the peace that God gives. When we receive and utilize what God has given us, we'll realize that God's commands are not grievous. God's directions aren't painful. What we find in the pages of Scripture, in that fragile rice paper, and if you've got a good Bible, it's made out of what they call a rice paper that you can wrinkle it. It can get abused a little bit, and you can straighten it out, put it back in a little, and then you come back a little while later, it won't even look like anything happened to it. That's just something about Bibles that I, that, that no, there, there, are, there are high quality Bibles and low quality Bibles, and it, that's a, thank God we got a Bible. There was a time we didn't, and it blew my mind that, as I, as you know, I was, I was not a believer for years, and here I am in England taking these these classes and learning about William Bede and all these people and Tyndale and all these people, what they went through to get the Bible into the hands of you and I. I just was trying to get through the class. But I look back now, and I'm so thankful for Miss Stacy, who taught regardless of the kind of dirt or field or ground it fell on, and she didn't realize years later 
that it would come to the forefront and be useful. Because the Bible's a love letter. Well, it's 66 love letters. God, he loves us. And he is showing us the way and he is explaining what we need to know. And if we will receive it in the way that it's given, in the way to be, to be presented, we will learn, we will live, we will love, and we will thrive. We will find rest and so many other wonderful things in that relationship with God. In fact, he, he says, Jesus says in Matthew 11, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Everybody say learn. There's nothing wrong in knowing you need to learn. There's nothing wrong in knowing you need to improve. Jesus goes on to say, for I am meek and lowly in heart and, and ye shall find rest for your souls. You don't need to be restless. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The prophet Jeremiah, who we know went through some hellacious things, said, thy words were found. And he, he talked about it in a reference. He said, I did eat them. Sometimes the word of God can be tough to swallow when you're stuck with a certain mindset. It's kind of, I looked at it like, I look at it like when I would sit down. I loved it when, my, when the meat and the potatoes or the macaroni and cheese got put on my plate. But when you put those peas on my plate, mm, some of that, it may have been good for me, but it was tough to get it down. Some of the word of God can be like that when you realize I need it. It's good for me but I've acquired a taste for something else. Are you hearing me? And he said, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Remember Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the biting asunder of soul and spirit and to the joints and the marrow, and as the discerner of the thoughts and the tents, excuse me, of the heart. Psalm has said in Psalms 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So when you're looking, when you're turning those pages and you're reading, and you find yourself living those words correctly, you will find that rest. No matter the torment or what's going on in the world, you will find that peace. Uh, you will have that, that peace that passes all understanding because you recognize this has to happen. It's in the word. I'm not going to freak out. I may not enjoy what's going on or watching my country go a certain direction or see what's happening, but I have a peace that lets me know I know what's in the word. Because, and I'm going to read it again. Listen intently what he told Timothy. Listen, Timothy. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So when you get to the book of Matthew and you find Matthew 28, 19, and you get to the end of Mark and you find Mark 15, 16. And you get Luke 24, 47. Acts 2, 38. Acts 10 and 47. Acts 19 and 1 through 6. They aren't meant to disagree. They are meant to harmonize. Write them all down together. Read them at once and you will see. There's not confusion there. When Brother Joe gets up there and speaks, he's saying the same thing as I am just in that Samoan dialect. He transposes his words sometimes. But don't get upset if you found a Hebrew Bible written in Hebrew. If you picked it up like we read our books today, you'll find you're going to have to flip it over and turn around because they write. What about if it's in Chinese? You see, these verses were not to cause divisions or different doctrines. They are written for harmony, and when you apply them properly, use them correctly, people will be saved. People will find rest for their souls because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Are you hearing me? It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 
Now, I don't recommend you do this for everything in life, but for the sake of tonight, I am going to do something to show you something. Hey, Siri, who changed the baptismal formula? I sent you a picture of this, so if you want to put that up, you can. I am going to the camera, folks. Am I in focus still? Can they read that? Go up. All right. All right. Is it on there? Water Baptism Study in the Britannica Encyclopedia, 11th edition, volume 3, page 365, 366. The baptismal formula was changed from the name of Jesus Christ to the words Father, Son, and Holy Ghost by the Catholic Church in the second century. I can give you a whole bunch more examples that shows you that people changed the doctrine of baptism. They changed it was never done any other way until the second century. Now, this is going to sound harsh, but I'm just going to be me for a minute. The book of Revelation says don't change it or you're cursed. The Galatians, Paul, who had a direct conversation with Jesus, said don't change it or you're cursed. Wait a minute. The Catholic Church changed it. The Baptist Church came out of the Catholic Church. Let me tell you something. We better get in the book. We better stay in the book. We better baptize in Jesus' name. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9 say, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. You better make sure you find harmony in the Scriptures. All those verses that I read to you in Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, they all say something slightly different, but they all mean the same thing. The Lord is at hand. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. If Paul got baptized in Jesus' name, well, if he repented, got baptized in Jesus' name, received the Holy Ghost, I want the peace of God. I'm going to do it like they did it in the Bible. I'm going to do it like it says right there. Let's all stand. Because Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest under your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You will not find anybody in the Bible, baptized in titles. That's why we don't do that. You don't. In fact, I could send a picture and he could put it up right now to explain to you to understand prepositional phrases. Anybody an English major in here? I know we have educators. You're an English major? If you don't understand what a prepositional phrase is, you got a pastor that does. And if you go to Matthew 8, 28, 19, you'll understand that it's talking about a singular name. Not titles. You'll understand that. And that's why when Peter, and I'll say this for the sake of, we know that Siri just informed us and let us know that the Catholic Church came to baptism. Well, it's so sad because how many know who the Catholics call as their first pope? Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the call. It's sad that they've changed their doctrine, their teaching from the Word of God. A gigantic conglomerate religious organization changed from what their first pope told them. 
I'm not trying to cause division. I am not here to cause disharmony. I am trying to preach to cause harmony to come back. We have enough garbage going on in this wicked world. It's time for the people of God to get it right. Keep it right. Love people back to the truth. Let's love people back to this. Wait a minute. Uh, uh, let me instruct you. You oppose yourself. Because if you don't get this right, you're lost forever. Don't, don't be tolerant thinking you're doing them a favor. Hell is not going to be tolerant. Don't worry about offending them now. Hell's going to be very offensive later. Be willing to put yourself on the line. If Jesus can stop a man of the nature and the character of Paul on the road to Damascus to reach out and then send him to an Ananias and a Bar Barnabas, I hope that you and I can be an Ananias and a Barnabas of today, that God could send someone that you can instruct them in the dangers of distorted doctrine.